Hey everybody, thank you for stopping by LED Live again. We have a great show for you today because we've been talking over the last few episodes of a lot of different devices, addictions, possession. How do you get freedom from all this? Find out on this episode of LED Live. So we hope you guys have enjoyed a few of the other episodes that we've put out with Eric Wilson. Thank you for coming by Thanks once again. Me. And I'm excited to dive into this because, you know, we've talked a lot about the problem and I'm ready to hear for the solution. How do we overcome some of these things? If we get ourselves entangled in this mess of sin, what are some of the steps we can get out? Before we get into that, I want to thank all our viewers. Thank you for you guys who have subscribed to our channel and you're liking our content or commenting with us. We really do appreciate you. In fact, many people have even sent us testimonies of things that have been said on this show that have really, really made you think or changed your life. We want to hear more of those. Feel free to send them to us, write to us. It encourages the whole team to keep going and if you guys have any suggestions for content we're listening to that as well and uh, if you're new to the channel we've got a lot of DVDs our ministry produces you can check us out on littlelightstudios.tv and patreon donors you guys are awesome we just love you guys to pieces because you guys really make all this possible so thank you for donating to our ministry so Eric Wilson, how do we how do we begin to get freedom from all this? Because you know, when you get in bondage to sin, it feels hopeless. It feels like there's no way out. And I know that that God is always giving us a way out. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> what I what I want to share today is not um, from book. It's from my own experience mm -hmm. and. You know, if you want to help somebody get free from alcohol, sometimes the best person to do that is someone who's gained victory. Right. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in a, a Christian home and, and then walking away from God, walking away from the Bible and, you know, Christianity, um, I always knew there was a God. I mean, even when I was serving the devil, I never doubted that there was a God, and I knew I was going to go to hell. I mean, I knew that. Interesting. Um, I can remember when I was probably 19 years old, I had probably 40 people at my house drinking and watching MTV at 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were yelling and acting like, you know, foolishness. And there was a knock on the door. And I'll never forget, there was a one or two, maybe three young men there. And they were high school age. And the one looked at me and he said, I want to share something with you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And it's like, that should have touched my right, heart. Right. I cursed him out. Oh, wow. Not like I was angry. I was just like, are you got to be kidding? I mean, blah, 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 yelling mm. at him. Mm. And, and I went back inside and we all laughed and mocked and until one night when God woke me up. Mm. And I'll never forget that night because I, I had been laying there in bed. I was reading a Stephen King novel. I mean, it's so funny. It's like we can't read one book in the Bible. And this Stephen King is over 600 pages. Right. And I'm devouring <laughs> right, it. Right, you know, right, you right, sit right. there for hours reading this trash. And I'm reading this book. I'm halfway through it. And finally, I'm like, okay, it's too late. I'm just going to go to bed. And I went to bed. And I just, I mean, I felt deep sleep. And all of a sudden, in the sleep, I saw this huge screen, like the one behind us. I mean, it was like a huge TV. And you have to remember, this was back a little while, a couple mm. years ago. <laughs> so here's this big screen TV, and I saw all these things that were happening in the world. Interesting. I mean, I saw like, you know, the war, I remember in Desert Storm. I mean, I know that's telling my age, but, you know, the war in Iraq. And I'm watching this and I'm seeing the riots and I'm seeing the stock market. And I'm seeing the economy collapse and I'm seeing race car, you know, track. I'm just seeing everything that's happening in the world. And then I started noticing that I recognized some of the people in the scenes that were flashing up on that screen. Hmm. And then I saw myself hmm. and the people that I knew and that I, my family and friends and people that I interacted with, you know, at the grocery store. And I saw how I treated others. And it was like it got, it got very quiet. Hmm. 
And all of a sudden, the only thing that I heard in that entire dream, I saw a hand reach up and it was like it pulled the plug out of the wall hmm. for the television. And then if you ever, and I know some of y'all may not remember this, but back um, when I was younger, television stations only ran until a certain time at night, and then you'd go to white screen. They called it snow. It looks sort of like some of the ones behind us. I, I don't think I remember any of that. <laughs> I think since I was a kid, I, I don't ever remember the TV being off, actually. Um, I didn't grow up with a lot of TV, so it could have easily happened, and I just didn't Yeah, well, it was like... He unplugged, this hand unplugged the, the screen from the wall, and the TV went shh, just like these ones behind us. Mm -hmm. And then I heard a voice, the only voice that I heard, and it said, this is your last chance. Hmm. Yeah. That was it. And I woke up, I mean, in that moment, I woke up, and I was covered in sweat. Mm. The whole bed was, you know, just sweat. Mm -hmm. And I looked over at the clock, and it's like it was flashing, like it had been unplugged, hmm. 3 a.m. Hmm. And I knew. I mean, there was no doubt. I mean, hmm. I, I knew. I knew who it was that had spoken to me. Hmm. And, I mean, I fell down on my knees, and I was like, God, I don't even know where to start. It's been so long since I've even talked to you or opened my Bible. That was a joke. Hmm. And I said, I give everything to you. I said, help me. I said, please save me. Don't give up on me. So the reason I'm sharing this is because a lot of times we as Christians, I think how to put this, the question came to my mind because I was taught by a lot of Christians and a lot of times when I went to church that salvation was sort of like um, an evolutionary process. It took the rest of your life, and you knew you were saved when the, you know, the, the doors of heaven were open to you, finally. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't, I mean, I can't do this. I can't, like, make myself better or wash myself or circumcise my own heart. And I was like, the Lord just helped reveal to me, is salvation creation or is it evolution? If it takes me a lifetime to fix you, that's evolution. Right. I don't serve an evolutionary God. Right. He spoke and things reacted to that in existence immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. He said, let there be light and it light was. Mm -hmm. That moment it was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, I, I, I can't handle an evolutionary process. I mean, I'm already in my 20s mm -hmm. and life was you know, in my mind, I was like, it wasn't good. Hmm. So what we want to look at is, how do you get free? I mean, does God put you on probation for six months or 12 hmm. months? You know, is there something simple that we're missing? Mm -hmm. I want to open with this verse in Jeremiah chapter 13. Thus saith the Lord, I have seen your adulteries and your nayings. The word names is like what a, a mule or a horse would do when it's in heat. Hmm. God is saying, that's you guys. Hmm. Uh, and this isn't just talking about um, immoral sin. He's saying, every time you cheat on me, that's adultery. That's hmm. fornication. He said, so I've seen your adulteries. I've seen you acting like you're an animal in heat and the lewdness of your whoredom. And I've seen your abominations on the hills and in the fields. And then he says, Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem, wilt thou not be made clean? Yeah. It's like God is right there offering us salvation, and we're like turning away our ear, acting like we can't hear him, mm -hmm. or, or we're re refusing to allow him to do what he desperately wants to do to, to help us. Hmm. Time does not wash away sins. And how many people have ever thought that? I mean, we all have. It's like, well, you know, maybe God will forget. Or, Man, I messed up and you feel guilty and you feel ashamed. And then you're like, you, you go to open your Bible the next morning and you're like, he's not going to even hear me. I mean, after what I did yesterday or last night, there's no way I can expect him to hear me. And then we're like, oh, you know what? I'll just go for a month. If I can just go for a month, you know, he'll forget about it. He's got all this other stuff going on. Time will cleanse me, but time doesn't wash sins away. Maybe if I can just be good enough for a set period of time and prove to God 
that I really am sorry and that I really have changed, then God will accept me and love me again. Has that ever went through your all's heads? And, you know, it doesn't matter how big the sin is. I mean, like, you know, for the, for the most righteous person in the church, it can be something tiny to us. Mm -hmm. But we still go through that. Mm -hmm. The enemy is telling us God doesn't love you because of what you did. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that God loved us so much that he sent Christ while we hated him. Mm -hmm. Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's how he could be on the cross and pray for the people that are nailing him to the cross, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like he just saw through whatever was happening to him and just realized we're all caught in sin, you know? And he had compassion on us. It's beautiful. You know, it, it, it amazes me, and I don't want to go into a, a whole bunch of my past, but I was a wretched, wicked human being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the Lord... I've caught myself, I mean, even while in ministry, there's times where I've caught myself looking at somebody else and thinking, man, they are so far gone. <laughs> and you know what God will say to me? Mm -hmm. He'll where, say, where were you? <laughs> Eric, do you remember the morning after you had fallen to whatever sin and you got on your knees and asked me to, to talk to you? And I came. Hmm. I came and talked to you after the night before you were doing something that makes me want to vomit. And I was like, and God was like, show them the same love. Hmm. Show that person the same consideration. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be like the worst reprobate in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite verses too. Job chapter 14, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Hmm. It's almost like uh, at Mount Sinai, you know, the Lord is there and he's proclaiming his law, you know, to all the million and a half or more children of Israel. And he gets done, you know, giving these commands. And you know what they said? Everything the Lord has said, we will do. And you know, God was like, oh man, this is going to be a long 40 years. <laughs> because they can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. I have been... Um, I've had people share with me. I know that their intentions were good, but they're like, Christ is our example. We have to follow his example. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And, you know, I'm 51 now, probably for the first 38 or 40 years, I tried that. I literally, I was like, everything you said, God, I'm going to do it. And then you fall and you're like, oh, God, I'm really sorry. I won't do that again, you know. And then you catch yourself a month or two or three months later and you're like, I cannot believe I did that again. And you're like, man, when? That's why people leave the church. They're like, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So we, we have been told sometimes Christ is our example. You see what he's doing, do it. Mm -hmm. And the Lord, I was, I was really praying about that. And one day he, he showed me uh, a parable. I can remember when my little boy was little. I mean, he's 21 now and taller than me. Um, but I can remember when he was eight years old. And I saw this picture of me out in the backyard, and I've got a wheelbarrow. I've got a pallet full of 50-pound or 80-pound concrete sacks on the pallet. And they all have to be moved to the other side of the yard where we're going to do some type of a wall or something. So I'm out there and I'm getting ready to do this and my little boy comes out and you know how little boys are. They're like, Daddy, 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 can I help you? And I'm like, well, yeah, this, is a, this will be a good experience for him. I'm like, well, son, let me show you how to do it first. So I pick up this 50 or 80 pound pack of concrete, put it in the wheelbarrow, pick the wheelbarrow up and I wheel it across the yard, take the concrete out and I bring it back and I say, you see how I did that? He says, yes, sir. I say, do thou likewise. I showed him how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I go, I'll be back in a couple hours and check on you. So I go inside, and about 30, 45 minutes later, I'm like, you know, I just need to check and see how he's doing. I stick my head out, you know, look out the window, and there's this little boy sitting on the ground <laughs> with his hands like this, and there's tears just running down his face. Mm -hmm. The wheelbarrow's tipped over. There's three bags of concrete that are broken open on the ground. And I'm like, and this is how we have been shown God. What's wrong with you? Look at this. You made a mess. 
I showed you how to do it. Why can't you do it? And then he's just crying more. Mm -hmm. And that's how Satan wants us to view our Father in heaven. He did not need an example of how to do it. He needed an example of surrender and faith. Mm -hmm. That's the example that Christ showed. Because mm -hmm. Christ said, I do nothing of myself. Mm -hmm. That's the example. It was God, he said in John chapter 14, that was in him doing the works. Mm -hmm. And that's even what Nicodemus said. He said, we know you're from God because no man can do the miracles that we see except God be with him. Mm -hmm. And the word with can actually be in. Mm -hmm. God was in Christ. That's what he wanted us to see. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden it's like, my little boy may want to pick up that wheel. He can't even get his hands on the wheelbarrow, much less get it or pick up. That's God saying, I want you to live a holy life. And we're like, we'll do it. <laughs> a few of the people understood that. Moses and those that were holy, they surrendered and they said, I can do nothing without you. And God came in them and empowered them to do. That's what God wants. You guys are being too quiet. <laughs> in Jeremiah chapter 13, the Lord tells us again, He says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or can the leopard change his spots? Then may ye also do good, which are accustomed to do evil. Hmm. So He's literally saying, Eric, you're a white guy. Mm -hmm. I can't, I'll pick on my son again. He used to always tell me when he was young, Daddy, I want to be a black man. And I was like, okay, why? He was like, because they're the best at, at sports. They're the best at football. They're the best at basketball. They can run faster. And I was <laughs> like, Connor. I said, that is so prejudiced. Yeah. I said, you know, if God has gifted them with athletic ability, which a lot of them he has, a lot of our brothers and sisters, you know, Afro African Americans, he has gifted them. But my son was like, you know, you can go have surgery, you can do whatever you want to do, but you're not going to be a black man. Mm -hmm. You weren't made to be one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same way, God is saying, a leopard cannot get rid of his spots by trying. Neither can you learn to do good by trying. Mm -hmm. There has to be a new heart put inside of you. Now, I think that's an absolute message of hope, obviously, because there is that just stumble and fall, get up, stumble, fall, get up. And every time you do that, that the, the shame of like, you know, I, I've done this so many times and I'm still in the same place. I'm still having this struggle. Or I'm still having this temptation or whatever. And, it, and, it, and that defeat can actually like really keep you in that state. But yeah. it's beautiful how God is just like, listen, it's not, you, it's not you that's going to do it, you know? He just needs us to surrender. That's right. right. Because when we surrender, and that, you know, when the Bible tells us in Colossians 1.27, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, that's not a metaphor. Right. That's literal. Mm -hmm. And I never understood that until I understood what it was like to have an evil spirit come in. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has heard stories, real life stories about there was some woman, that she's 130 pounds, and obviously she was possessed and it took five guys to hold her down mm -hmm. that weigh over 200 pounds. Mm -hmm. There's no way a 130 pound woman can fight off five men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless something else is inside her, mm -hmm. strengthening her. Mm -hmm. But God says, that's what I want to do. But mm -hmm. you've got to let me in. You can't just take the book knowledge. You've got to let the living word, the living Jesus Christ right. come into his temple and reign. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything. That's why Ezekiel 36, I don't know if you're going to bring that verse up. No, no, but that's a good one. <laughs> it's a really great verse to really illustrate the concept that, you know, I will, you know, give you a new heart and I will cause you to walk in my uh, judgments and you will keep my statutes. Like, that's, that's God putting His Spirit inside of us and He causes us to do that. That's not, that's not saying, well, if you just try hard enough or you just do this, right. you're going to do it. It's simply opening your heart to Christ and saying, I can do nothing outside of you. You have permission inside of my heart. You come and do the changing. Right. And He comes in and causes you to walk in those ways. 
And the one thing, just so that people don't think, well, man, you've left nothing for man to do. I right. mean, we can just sit back. For sure. The hardest thing to do, two things, is surrender and believe. Yep. You have to yield your will. Mm -hmm. and, and the will is sort of like uh, the steering wheel on the car. Mm -hmm. um, it's what controls the whole car, mm -hmm. the will. So there's times in my life where I've been like, man, I want to do this and I know I shouldn't. And there's a battle going on. Mm -hmm. But I'm realizing that the only thing that causes the battle or allows that battle to stay is selfishness. Mm -hmm. Me wanting to do what pleases me. Mm -hmm. The moment I just say, Christ, you know this battle, because he, when he was tempted in all points like us, it wasn't like appetite, it was just generic temptation. Okay, I won that one. No, he took Eric's battle with appetite. Mm -hmm. He took Eric's battle with alcohol. Mm -hmm. He took your battle with bitterness or rejection or lust or whatever it was. He took your personal sin and overcame it. So when God promises us a new heart, that heart is Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ was like, I already conquered your sin. So why are you? Paul says in Romans 6, he says, sin doesn't have dominion over you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the word dominion means? Like power yeah. over you? Yeah, ruler. Mm -hmm. He's not your slave master anymore. Mm -hmm. That means stand up and walk. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but we don't believe that. It's so simple. It's like God's spoken something. He spoke the universe into existence, but yet he says, you're free. Walk like it. And we're like, yeah, but I don't feel free. Right, right. What, you know, when we consider just the faith aspect of this, like, you know, God, you go back all the way to the beginning creation of the world, and he's speaking things into existence. And when God speaks, bam, worlds or stars or fish Amen. or whatever are, 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 are developed, right? Amen. Right. Then you, you think of the story of Jesus when he was on the boat with the disciples. And, you know, you've got this raging storm. He's sleeping. I mean, I, I just think that's so, so awesome that Jesus, he's so peacefully connected to God. It doesn't matter if the storm's crashing around him. He could take a nap. Right. And then he stands up and he's like, you know, uh, peace be still to the wind and the waves. And the Bible actually uses a word right there. It says immediately uh -huh. it ceased. Amen. So when God speaks something, immediately something happens, right? Amen. So it's so interesting. We have all of these. I mean, when he healed people in the Bible, right? He, he immediately that hour, like when he healed the servant uh, uh, of the of the um, Roman soldier, right? Um, immediately that hour, when this when the Roman soldier went back, they asked him, "What time was it that you said that?" And the second that Jesus said it, that happened. There was no amount of time that was that was after that. Any of the healings, you are clean. Bam, they're clean. So we've got these examples of God speaking and something happening, and He makes all these promises that I can make you clean. Mm -hmm. Do we actually believe that? That's the point that I believe is, is difficult for people to, to really wrap their head around. Right. Keith, did you have something? I did. I had it pulled up. No, and I went to look up something else. I got to pull it back up here. Yeah, it's in Matthew chapter 11. It's an interesting way that Jesus puts this. He says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, which is, is a pretty good description of humanity. Right? Yeah. We're weighed down by sin. We have all these problems, and we're we're struggling. We're laboring to get free, right? And so then he puts it in this context. He says, "Take my yoke." Well, a yoke is for oxen, and a yoke is for two, right? He says, "Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light." Well. If he's coming to you and says, okay, you need this yoke, now rest. The implication is you're still moving. Well, how are you resting under that yoke? And now it's light and easy. It's because he's the one doing the pulling. Amen. Not mm -hmm. you. Amen. 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 I just, Amen. I just thought this illustration I know, regarding the first... Uh, who can bring a clean things out of an unclean things? Just imagine a glass of water, of mineral water, and then our sin is like a black ink, and uh, try with our own ability to separate the ink and the water. Right. We can't do it, so we need another mineral water <laughs> to be poured in it. 
to be able to make it clean again. Amen. That's right. That's right. I've seen examples of that. How they, how yeah they dump a solution. I don't remember what it is. You were a chemist. What what was it, the two chemicals that you dump together that you can make uh, it clear again? Boy, what's that? It's like was the it like starch pneumonia? And the yeah, or something like that. Experiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you mm -hmm. pour one in and it makes it cloudy. You pour it in another and it makes it look clear again. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting? In Romans chapter 4, it actually tells us something to this. It says, speaking of Abraham and about how it's faith, it doesn't do away with righteousness or obedience, but it means by faith, he comes in and does it. Mm -hmm. It says, as it is written, I have made thee, speaking of Abraham, a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they already are. Hmm. So God looked out in the very beginning and everything was black. And he said, this will never do. <laughs> Let there be light. Boom, there was light. He looked into a man with leprosy and said, be thou clean. Immediately he was cleansed. He looks into somebody who is filthy in sin and he says, be thou righteous. He speaks righteousness, it says in Isaiah 45 and 63. Keith? I was going to say, just the simplicity of the gospel really tells us how it all works because the Bible tells us Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Amen. Right? And Paul says, of whom I am chief. If we could fix it, we wouldn't need Jesus. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Right? So he's not saying, okay, I've come, now do it on your own. He says, no, I've come, and I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to save you. That implies he's the one doing the rescuing. He's the one doing the saving Amen. because we can't do it. He who is able to keep thee from falling, right? And present mm -hmm. you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Goes right along with that. It isn't you're that's the right. one that's keeping from falling. It's he's the one that's able to keep you from falling. And do you know what's weird? If it's God that works in us both to will and to do what pleases him, that's exactly what Satan does. These actors and actresses, these musicians that we've been talking about, they literally say, I get down on my knees and I open myself up to the spirit world and I say, come into me and do this acting or do this song or, or do these martial arts. And when we do that, they come in and they do the part. The evil spirits do. You, you so know, how much more would God not come in and do exceeding abundantly more than we could ask or imagine? You know, you bring up a really good point that I've actually never considered before. I have seen countless interviews with musicians that have literally said, a week ago, I could not play. And then I let this spirit in and they're up on the stage jamming and just going on. And everybody goes, yay, that's so awesome, right? because they were able to do something, but it really wasn't them that was right. doing it. It was that spirit that was inside of them. So it's easy for us to see that on a pop culture level. Why can't we apply that to God even more? You Amen. know what I mean? And that, if we could take hold of that mm -hmm. and believe it, mm -hmm. and, and the word believe in Hebrew is an action. Mm -hmm. It's not up here alone. Pishteo. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It means, it means that, that because they believed, there was an action that followed that. It wasn't just a simple belief like, yes, I believe that Jesus is real. Devils believe that Jesus is real. They know he's real. They called him Jesus, uh, oh, son of the most high. You know, like they spoke that when they were getting thrown out of the demoniac. So it's just knowing who he is does not merit you for eternal life. But even their belief has action mm -hmm. because it says even the devils believe and tremble. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Right. It's true. So the, and, and they're working against him because they believe. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and there's action associated with that. Have any of you seen that film, um, Facing the Giants? Mm -hmm. um, it was a powerful story. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some things in it that maybe I saw a little bit different, but it was a powerful Christian story. I never forget that scene where it showed that older man walking down that school hall and he was putting his hands on every single locker, praying for every one of those children. And he'd been doing it for years, and God did a miracle. And I think, you know, we need to be doing that, mm -hmm. but we have to do it with faith. God, you promised you would do this. We're stepping out of the boat in faith. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Amen. Lord, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. You wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Now, I want you to, to look with me, because there's some things I caught in this when I was getting this program put together. He said, purge me with hyssop. Hmm. Hyssop was what you used to cleanse leprosy or a leper's house. Hmm. Because if you had lived, it's funny because in what we're living in right now, it's like, you know, they're saying, well, COVID lasts for 15 days or 21 days on hard surfaces. So take for instance, this man had leprosy. It was worse than COVID. Maybe it was like, you know, AIDS that could be picked up just by touching surfaces. And when a leper wanted to be clean, the priest is like, okay, fine, you're clean. We see the leprosy's gone, praise God. But now we gotta go take care of your house because otherwise the house has to be burned. Hmm. So they would go into the house and take hyssop and cleanse the house. Hmm. Well, King David here is saying, your house, my body, your temple is filthy and it's got leprosy. I'm begging you, cleanse me. And then he says, hide thy face from my sins. And that caught my attention because the Bible says that the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquities of us all. And do you know what the Lord did when Jesus was on the cross? He veiled he his face. He turned his face. And Christ called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you can think about that, Jesus never had one day in his entire existence that he felt like his father was not there. I mean, he always knew his father was happy and, and delighted in him. And for the first time in his entire life, he felt what it was like for God to turn away. And it wasn't that God left Christ, but he had to look away from him because of your sins and my sins. You know, we often talk about the experience from Jesus' perspective that he went through that at the cross. And, you know, it, it was amazing. But as a father, I also think of the experience of God because if you have the power to stop it and yet you don't, I mean, I would do all in my power to literally take whatever pain, whatever, I mean, for me. So, so I look at that and I go, you know, Yes, Jesus suffered immensely on that cross, but also think about what God suffered. I can't imagine. Even just turning his face when he had every amount of power to stop that which has happened. And that's just like, you know, I can't wait to get to heaven and meet these, you know, face yeah. to face. I want to see. And hug them. Yeah. Can you imagine what it would be like to hug Christ and to hug yeah. God? Yeah, I know. Wow. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 10 and 11. And this is what our Father in heaven said to his son before he came here. He was giving his son the words to speak to you and I. He says, therefore, O thou son of man, he says, therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel and tell them, thus you speak, saying, if my transgressions and my sins be upon me and I'm consumed in them, how shall I then live? And listen to what God's answer is. Say unto them. That means your name. Read your name into the verse. Say unto them, Eric Wilson, as I live, saith the Lord God, for the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, because the just shall live by faith, that's the other verse in Habakkuk. But it was like when I was reading Ezekiel 33, the Lord told me, it was like it came to my mind immediately. How shall we then live? The just shall live by faith. And I thought about it and I was like, so Jesus was carrying the sins of every human being that has ever lived. I know what I have felt like before when I've fallen to one sin. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, if you took my whole life, that's innumerable. Mm -hmm. But if you took my life with innumerable, I can't even count them, times... Seven billion. <laughs> that, and that's living today. Right. What about from the beginning of the earth? Right, right, right. Christ, all of those personal sins were laid on him. So he's on the cross feeling the guilt as if he had done it himself. Hmm. Wow. And he dies. And then God wakes him up. Sends the angel Gabriel to wake him up on that morning of the third day. 
And Jesus never looks back. He doesn't wake up in the morning and go, oh, man, I, you know, I remember yesterday what I was doing. He woke up and it was like, God woke me up. We had made a covenant. I told God that if I would bear the sins, God said, I'll forgive them. He never looked back. So from the day that God raised Christ from the dead, he has been living every day by faith. Mm. That's why it says we have the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I can say my sins are gone. Right. They were blotted out on Calvary. Right. That's a key little part of that verse is it's of Jesus, not in Jesus. You alone. Know what I mean? like yeah. Alone. Like, not that I just believe in Jesus, but I have the same faith that Jesus experienced. Because he's in me. That's right. So that means let this mind be in us, which was in him. I will write my laws in their Heart. hearts. And then he says, and your sins and your iniquities, yeah. I will remember no, no more. more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I used to think, well, that's when I get to heaven. Mm -hmm. It's now. Mm -hmm. If I confess it to him, Christ bore it and God forgives it. And he says, it's gone. Okay. As far as the east is from the west. There is only one thing that can cleanse the heart from the stain of sin. And that is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one thing. And you know, that, that hit me one day because I was like, how? I mean, honestly, I mean, I know the Bible says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But how? And I know maybe I'm silly, but it's like my, that's how my mind thinks. I'm like, okay, fine, it does, but how? I, wanna, I need to see a picture. And then the Lord showed it to me in Romans chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. The Bible says that the life is in the blood. When Jesus died for us, it wasn't just simply saying, I'll take the beating that Eric Wilson deserves. God, I, I grew up with this picture of a God that was like, God is in heaven, he's on his throne, he's angry because he just found out that Eric sinned and he's angry. And he's like, what am I doing? All the angels are afraid to talk to him. You know, leave him alone, he's upset. He's like, I'm going to do something this and he's like all right there's got to be blood there's got to be blood or i'm not going to be happy i know i'm just going to kill eric i'm angry at him i can't believe he sinned i'm going to kill him and then here comes jesus no, no 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 father please don't kill him i'll take the beating for him that's how i grew up seeing god hmm. and it was like so i love jesus but I really didn't care a whole lot about God because I didn't think God cared about me. Or God tolerated me on a good day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on a bad day, he would just soon kill me if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus had stepped in. And that makes you not believe that God loves you. Mm -hmm. it That's actually how the devil wants you to see God in a fearful light. <clears throat> Do you know that I'm 51 and I spent almost 40 years in that bondage? Mm -hmm. And there was no joy, there's no freedom mm -hmm. at all. Peace, no peace. That's right. When Jesus died on the cross, Romans 6, verse 10 and 11 says, in that he died, he died unto sin once. Mm -hmm. So he had Eric Wilson's sin. My love for food or my lust over other women or my bitterness toward family members. He had my personal sin, and Jesus was like, oh, this is killing Eric. And it's so overwhelming inside of me. He felt what the power of temptation felt like. And he said, Father in heaven, I choose to die rather than yield to Eric's sins. Hmm. And the moment that he did that, because I was in him, his victory became mine. Mm -hmm. His crucifixion became my crucifixion. His resurrection is my resurrection to walk in newness of life. It changes everything. That's why the next verse, Paul says, Reckon you also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Reckon it means, I don't reckon so. It means count it as so. It's a, an accounting term, which I know Keith knows about that. Mm -hmm. Reckon it. It means I'm reckoning out wages today. This is your wages. This is yours. This, God is like, reckon it. You are dead, but you're alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that takes faith. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to close with just a couple of really powerful illustrations. I want you to listen to these words. 
And I love this book. It's a book called Desire of Ages. If I, if I could only give out one book besides the Bible, this would be my book because this one is it's breathtaking. Listen to what it says on page 823. This world is a vast Lazar house. That means a, a place full of the sick and dying. But Christ came to heal the sick and proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. Hmm. And I know what that's like. I mean, I've been sick. I know what that's like. Hmm. But I have to keep going back and saying, God, I'm not going to let go of you because hmm. you swore with an oath and you cannot lie. Hmm. He came to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself both health and strength. And he imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, and those possessed of demons. When he saw somebody like that and he said to the demon, you've got to leave, and the demon said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I have every right to be here. They want me here. And Jesus is like, but they're asking for freedom. And the devil says, yeah, but they send back there, and the wages of that sin is death. And Christ said, well, there's only one way to fix this. I'll take Eric Wilson's sins, and I'll give him my life. What right do you have to be there now? Hmm. The devil had no right. Mm -hmm. And Christ cast them out, and they had to obey. Do you know that happened with the two demoniacs? Hmm. When you read it in the Gospels, Jesus spoke to them, and they refused to come out. Hmm. That's why he said, what is your name? Because he realized they should have left instantly. Hmm. And then they were like, legion. And he was like, okay, we can take care of this. There's a whole bunch of you in there, hmm. thousands. Hmm. They had to obey when Christ exchanged lives. Hmm. And that's what he's telling us today. Hmm. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, and those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. Not one. In all of the Gospels, there was not one person that came and asked to be healed, and he refused to heal them. Hmm. Not one. Hmm. The Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way of life. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquities of us all. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue, that word means dunamis, miraculous power, when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as their physical maladies. The gospel, the glad tidings, still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? A lot of people say all you have to do is believe, and then you have another group of people that say, no, 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 no. There's got to be works too. If you honestly believe, there will be works. Because works can't be separated from genuine faith. It's like the illustration of love. You, you, you can't just be like, I love my wife and I'm not going to do anything for her. You know That's what I mean? right. Mm -hmm. That love will be demonstrated whether it's washing the dishes, vacuuming the house, scrubbing the floor. Remembering the anniversary. Know, yeah, all those kind of things. You, it's just a natural thing you're going to do for someone that you love them. So if you are in love with Jesus, you're going to naturally desire to do things that you know please God. And you know what? If it's raining outside and I've got my PJs on and, my, and I love my wife and she looks at me and it's 11 o'clock at night and she says, I would really like this special treat that they have at this grocery store and they're still open for 20 minutes. Would you go get it for me? If I genuinely love her, even though I may not want to go out, I do it anyway mm -hmm. because of love. Mm -hmm. I surrender and I sacrifice my life and my pleasure for my wife mm -hmm. because I love her. Mm -hmm. just like what we would do for our children. Mm -hmm. 
I like this parable about faith and works. What I like is when Jesus healed this guy that can't walk uh, by the pool of Bethesda. Because mm -hmm. Jesus just said, you know, take up whatever you have and then go for what? Just, mm -hmm. just go. Mm -hmm. What if the guy just, he said he believed, he said, okay, I believe you can heal me, but I'm gonna just walk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna work. <laughs> right. That's right. right. Yeah, he had to react to his belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. One more uh, statement I want to share with you. Listen to this. And this was written by a man um, at, a, at an old-fashioned camp meeting back in 1895. His name was uh, Prescott. Listen to what this man said. You can tell he was inspired by the Lord. He says, to believe on Jesus Christ is to receive Christ. And remember, mm -hmm. Christ is the Word of God. To believe on Christ is to receive Christ, not to assent to a creed, but to accept a life, not to strive for the mere maintenance of certain outward forms, but to become the partaker of the divine nature. Creeds and forms cannot save people from their sins. Terrible is the catalog of those sins, of those having a form or shape of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Christ in us, the hope of glory. A new life must be imparted before a man can live unto God. Jesus said, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Jesus told us, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. My throne is in your heart. I want to reign, but not as a monarch on some throne that's physical. I want to reign inside of your life. That means if I reign, I win every battle. You know, we as humans, we want to be in control of our own lives. We call it being on the seat of our own thrones, right? Yeah. And so we're, we're sitting on that throne and we're like, I want to make my own decisions and I want to do this, right? But realistically, we then are slaves to sin and we're just doing the bidding of an, another master, right? When Jesus is actually saying, listen, I, I want you to, to, to allow me onto the throne of your heart and I will bring you up and we can rule together Amen. on the throne of that heart. So it's like you get at the end of the day what you originally wanted anyway, was that, that to rule your own, it's just that you're now doing it with Christ. Empowered by Him. That's right. Amen. And then Prescott says something. He said, this experience of Christ reigning within you and having this new life depends upon the faith which each one of us exercise for ourselves. To all who sincerely pray the prayer, create in me a clean heart, the reply comes, believe ye that I am able to do this? According to your faith, be it unto you. For our Father has spoken to every one of us when he said through his Son, Today you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's John 15, verse 3. I mean, he literally says, today. And so as you read that, put your name in there. Yeah, it's not a recipe. It's not follow steps 1 through 10. You know what I mean? Like there's not a... a a labyrinth that you need to walk through to achieve the end of this thing. It's literally take him at his word. And, and you know what is weird for me? I, I, I want to make this simple because I believe in God's law. Mm -hmm. I love God's law. Do you know why? Because he said that. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I delight to do thy will. Your law is in my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, if this mind and this heart are in me, which was in Jesus, then I can say that. Mm -hmm. So when a temptation comes, I go, wait a minute. Christ is in me. God, I delight to do thy will. Your law is in my heart. So as we speak his word, claiming it as ours, that's how God dwells and reigns within us. Mm -hmm. So it's like when, when we look at you know, a law, we also have to remember something. God's commands are promises. I never understood that. I can remember when I was a young boy and I went to school and, and or went to church and they would say, God said, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then one day I, I was reading and the Lord just showed me, Eric, this is a promise. And I was like, how is that a promise? He said, read your name into it. I was like, thou shalt not commit adultery. And God was like, read your name into it. I was like, 
thou. And God was like, that's you. It's not them, it's you, thou. I was like, Eric Wilson, thus saith the Lord. I promise you won't commit adultery. Hmm. And I was like, God can't lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he can't lie. Mm -hmm. So he already promised me that. Mm -hmm. And you know what's neat? The promise was named Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He is the word of promise. So Christ came and lived my life for me and gained the victory for me if I will just let him in and accept his life as mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hide him in your heart that I may not sin against thee. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anyway, we, uh, I pray that you guys will, will take hold of the gospel. Remember, the gospel means glad tidings. It means good news. It's not just a set of rules. Um, and I don't want to go off into something else, but it's like if I had if I had a friend of mine send their child over to spend the night at our house, and and let's say they ate possum off the road, and I'm like, okay, you're here at our house for the summer. We don't eat possum in this house. And the little boy's like, I'm mad. We always ate possum when I was at home. Well, now you're part of a new family. We're teaching you a new way to live, and it actually will give you more life than the possum will. So it's like that way with God. God is not trying to make rules to check off so that you can make it into heaven. He's trying to show you the way that, that we live in heaven. And if we can prepare for that here, heaven will be a joy. So if you're able to, um, or if you have questions, please contact Little Light Studios or contact us at Isaiah Ministries. I'll be happy to mail you um, some of the promises of where we got these and, and how they were a help to me. But let us know what we can do to help. Don't forget to like, subscribe to our channel, and we'll leave some links in the description so you can get a hold of Eric Wilson if you'd like to, or um, leave a comment about today's show. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.